I'm sure your favorite Bible character is going to be Matthew. Matthew. I missed that one. I'm sorry. Well, let me remind you of the three presuppositions for our Bible study together. I think you know them well by now, but um, just in case you don't, I'll go over it. I think I better do this every day. There may be a few people that have wandered in that haven't been with us all week. And so we're, we're studying characters in the Bible, but in a little bit different way, because we're trying to say that, that uh, the individuals are not the real hero of the story. The real hero of Bible stories is God, and what we learn about God is what we're really looking for. Uh, I've been quoting Jeremiah 31, verse 3, the Lord appeared to us in the past. Now, if that's true about uh, so many instances where he appeared, we want to see what his face looked like. We want to really try to get acquainted with the Lord. That's what we're looking for, to try to find God as the hero of every story. And then secondly, I've been saying that the Bible is God's voice speaking to us. The important thing for you and me today is not just seeing what happened to those people back there when God was talking to them, but how does that translate to what God wants to say to you and me today? It is in this way that we hear the voice of God in our own time and in our own place. That's the important thing, that we hear the voice of God speaking to us. Romans 15, 4, everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. That's what we're looking for. And then finally, I'm, I'm becoming more and more convinced every day I study the Bible that the Bible stories are really about salvation. It's not so much about all the other things that could be, but about salvation. Is this guy going to circle our tent to the whole day here? Come on down and listen, why don't you? We're trying to find out about salvation, not just the great stories and as they happen, but uh, about salvation. 2 Timothy 3.15, the Bible is able to make us wise unto salvation. Let's study it with that in mind. So with those three presuppositions, and so far no one has jumped me afterwards and disagreed with any of those presuppositions, so I'm going to assume that we're all reading off the same page. I want to talk this morning about the the wanderings of the children of Israel in the wilderness and the articles of uh, furniture that inhabited the sanctuary that was right in the center of the Israelite camp. It's interesting, the Bible's word for journeying without direction is wandering. And the children of Israel are the greatest wanderers in the Bible story, aren't they? journeying without direction because they weren't following God's leading for what they really wanted. It was pretty, it's pretty clear in the Bible that it was God's plan to take them out of Egypt with a mighty hand through the Red Sea on dry ground with these amazing demonstrations of God's power over against the power of the Egyptian gods, which is a whole other study, isn't it? At a time, I believe, when Egypt was at the height of its power. There is debate um, um, exactly when the Exodus took place, the 18th dynasty and the 20th dynasty. Many people who, who are proponents of a 20th dynasty Exodus say that because they find a place in the 20th dynasty where Egypt was weak and didn't have much power and probably couldn't stop an uprising of slaves against their owners, their masters, who would just walk out of the country. I don't think that's the way God works. I think God would find no particular glory in humbling a nation that is already humble. It seems to me that God brought the, the slaves out, the Israelites out, probably at the height of Egyptian power, it's one of the reasons I believe in the 18th dynasty and, and the pharaoh and the, that is usually given the 18th dynasty uh, time of the exodus, probably the most powerful pharaoh of all of Egyptian history. But it was God's idea to bring the children of Israel out through the Red Sea, establish them as his people around the holy mountain, Mount Sinai, give them his commandments, 
give them the directions that he wanted to go, and then take them directly into the promised land. Don't you believe that was God's plan? But of course, the people did not follow that, and uh, they ended up wandering without direction for 40 years, being scattered, not knowing where you're going. That's what wandering is all about. Being lost, unable to find your way to where you really want to be. And I think it's probably uh, a good definition of people today who are wandering without spiritual direction in their lives. Wandering is a good word for us too. I'm sure you have all experienced being lost. I've been uh, driving out with Stephen uh, from his home about 10 minutes away and uh, not paying any attention to how to get to camp from his house until I found out that this afternoon I'm going to drive from his house out to here. And suddenly it became very important to me when to turn right and when to turn left I've been lost a couple of times. The very first time I went to Europe, I was driving in Belgium with uh, seven other people. We had two cars, and we were following uh, my wife's brother and his car, and we were driving, trying to get out to the airport in Brussels from where we were, and we were driving around and around and trying to find the signs that said to the airport and trying to, to get there at a good time. and. And I began to notice that there was this one ancient round tower that we passed three times. <laughs> and I thought, I'm sure the road from here to the airport didn't mean to take us to the air around the tower three times. Finally pulled him over, and I said, I think we're lost. It was the wrong thing to say to my wife's brother. He said, well, if you think you're so smart, you lead. <laughs> so I led, and... Uh, we only passed the tower two more times, I'm happy to say. <laughs> Finally, we got to the airport. It's a terrible thing to be lost and not know where you're going, isn't it? To be wandering around without uh, direction, without knowing. There's probably no better illustration of the Israelite wandering than the episode we read in Exodus chapter 32, the, the episode about the golden calf. If you'd like to turn there to Exodus 32... Can you hear me okay with the airplane or need to speak up a little bit? You're okay? All right. I have no idea what I'm saying. Can't hear myself. But if you can, that's fine. You remember this amazing uh, story. Moses is up in the mountains. Well, down below in the camp, the Israelites are beginning to complain again. You remember they didn't take the Israelites very long to begin grumbling. They were grumbling before two months had passed from leaving Egypt, asking for more food and for more water, and why are we coming out here to die? And now they begin to grumble again, and they go to the leader that's left in the camp, Moses' brother Aaron. And Aaron is um, a little nonplussed. Was that from the airplane, or was it something else? <laughs> we had this yesterday, didn't we? <laughs> How can you possibly concentrate? <laughs> How can I concentrate? What are we talking? Good morning, my name is Stuart Tyner. No, no, we did that, didn't we? Okay, I'm going to try to forge ahead. Somebody sing? will correct that. Can you sing too? <laughs> I think we're in the kindergarten tent, aren't we? Beautiful. Yeah. Um, The sweet voice she has. I, if she comes on again, let's sing with her. We can do that. <laughs> okay, we'll try it again in the Golden Calf episode. The children of Israel come to Aaron. Aaron doesn't know quite what to do, but he gives in to the wishes of the wandering people who have been staying in the same place for a few days, but they're wandering spiritually already. And interestingly, while he is down there making the golden calf and the people begin to dance around it, the scene in Exodus 32 shifts back up to the mountain to God's uh, discussion with Moses there. And all of a sudden, uh, verse 7 breaks into the golden calf episode 
with the dialogue between God and, and Moses. Look what it says. Chapter 32 of Exodus, verse 7. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down because your people whom you brought out of Egypt have become corrupt. Interesting verse, isn't it? And can't you imagine the look on Moses' face when God said, your people whom you brought out of Egypt are becoming corrupt. I think Moses said at that point, excuse me, just a minute, I thought they were your people. I thought you brought them out of Egypt. How did they get to be my people? And how come I'm bringing them out of Egypt all of a sudden? And God said to them, to Moses, when they began worshiping the golden calf instead of me, they're your people, not mine. Oh, amazing moment for Moses up on Mount Sinai, isn't it? Just an amazing moment. And so uh, Moses goes down to the camp. And again, in this same chapter, one of the most astonishing dialogues in the entire Bible takes place. And I have to tell you that this conversation, the one between Moses and his brother Aaron, is for me one of the proofs of the inspiration of the Bible. It is a proof of the inspiration of the Bible to me because I'm sure no human being would have made this up. Look what happens. Moses comes down. The people are dancing around the golden calf. Moses finds Aaron in the middle of the crowd, and he begins to say, Don't be angry with me, Aaron says to Moses. You know how prone these people are to evil. And then he begins to tell his brother what happens. And look at verse 24. I told them, whoever, whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. And then Aaron says to his brother, they gave me the gold. I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. <laughs> Is that not amazing? Nobody would have made that up. Moses, who we believe wrote the story, surely would not have put those words in his brother's mouth. He didn't dislike his brother and want us all to think he was an idiot. No, this is a true story. It happened this way, and Moses remembered Aaron's word. I threw in the gold, and out came this calf, <laughs> which obviously is not the way it happened. Just a great example of the spiritual wandering that was going on with the people and with Aaron, their leader, at that same time. Uh, Moses, you remember what happened then, uh, punishes the people. He goes back up to the mountain, and another great conversation takes place in, in uh, chapter 33. Moses has gone back up to the Lord, and the Lord has said to him, I want you to go ahead and go into the promised land. There you'll... Um, You'll defeat all the enemies that are going. I'm going to send an angel ahead of you. Your enemies will be defeated. You will love the promised land. But I have to tell you, I'm not going to go with you. God says to Moses early in chapter 33, verse 3, go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you're a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. God understanding that evil and divinity do not coexist. And so he says, I, I'm a little fearful of my own power here, and my temper might break out. I mean, I mean, if somebody comes up to me and says, I threw in the gold in the fire and out came the calf, I'm not sure what I might do to them. He says, so the angel will go with you, but I'm not going. And again, Moses Moses' mouth drops open as he hears God's words to him. And this beautiful plea that he has in uh, verse 15 and 16. Look in, uh, look in 16. How will anyone know that you're pleased with me and your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? What else will distinguish us from everyone else unless your presence is with us? 
My friends, it is the same for you and me today. What distinguishes us, you and me, from everybody else in the world is not that we go to church on the seventh day of the week. It's not that we pay tithe. It's not that we expect Jesus to come again. What distinguishes us from all other people is only if the presence of God is with us. Is the presence of God with us as we worship on the seventh day of the week? Is the presence of God with us as we talk to each other about the second coming? Is the presence of God with us as we meet together in the big tent at camp meeting here this morning? If it is, then we are the happiest people in the world. In God's presence is fullness of joy. If we're grumpy with each other, if we're giving only to build golden calves, if we are critical of each other, if we can't find joy in the sun and the rain that are sent to us, if we're constantly complaining, if spiritually we're wandering around and God's presence isn't with us and we're no different than anybody else in the world. If we want to be a unique people, a peculiar people, then we must go back to Exodus 33 and say to God the same thing that Moses said to him. What else will distinguish us from all the people in the world unless your presence is with us? Do you agree? We must wake up every day and make sure that we are aware of God's presence because, frankly, God's here, isn't he? He's here in the tent. He's here in the campgrounds. He's here in your lovely country. He's here with us. God's presence is in everywhere. But unless we are aware of his presence, we don't act like he's here. We can deny that God's presence is with us if we just ignore it and act like he's not around. When you whisper conversations to the person next to you, are you aware of the fact that God's presence is here and he hears the words you whisper as well? When you are critical of, um, of your neighbor or the leaders in the campground, when you don't like the way the security guards are, are keeping the parking lots dry, they're not doing a very good job of that. So let's criticize those people with the hats and the, you know, God's listening to that too. Why don't we start acting like God's presence is here? Why don't we begin to treat each other like God's presence is here? One more point before we leave this episode, just over in chapter 35, as they begin to build the tabernacle, which Moses brought the instructions down from the mountain when he came. They need the, all of the materials to, to build the tabernacle. You remember all the things that they have to put together. They've got to build from something. Nobody went to the building supply store and brought out uh, all the building supplies into the desert. And so they ask the people in a big congregation, we need you to bring, and they give them a list of the things that they need. And verse 20 says of chapter 35, the whole uh, Israelite community withdrew from Moses' presence. Everyone who was willing and whose heart moved came back and brought an offering to the Lord for the work of the tent of meeting and for all of its services, and for the sacred garments. All who were willing, men and women alike, came and brought gold jewelry of all kinds, brooches, earrings, rings, and ornaments. They all presented their gold as a wave offering to the Lord. Anyone who had blue or purple or scarlet yarn, yarn fine linen, the same thing. It's interesting to me that the process is exactly the same for people bringing their gold and their silver and their finery there are two things that can happen with our possessions. We can give them to Aaron to make a golden calf, or we can give them to Moses to build the tabernacle. The same kinds of things are given. The same giving process is there, only with one giving, we create golden calves, and with the other giving, we create tabernacles. Where are your, what is happening to the giving that you're doing? Where are your possessions going? I don't think this is about the particular kind of possessions that people gave. I think it's about the purpose of the giving. You can give your gold and your silver 
to make golden calves, and many of us do much of our lives. We create things that ultimately will be crushed into little pieces and strewn on the ground. Or we can create places for people to worship God. Places for people to understand the, God, the presence of God with us. It is the purpose of our giving that's important here. So the people began to learn some lessons about wandering. And one of the lessons that keep us from wandering is to follow God's direction. And here he gives us the directions for building a place of worship. Exodus 25, 8, earlier in the story, he said, Make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among you. You know, the only other place in the Bible where this kind of language is used is in John chapter 1, verse 14, where Jesus became a human and dwelt among us. The Message Bible paraphrases this, Jesus became a human and he moved into our neighborhood. I like that translation. He moved into our neighborhood. It's an important thing to understand that the incarnation of God's ministry to humans happens in our neighborhoods. In the year 1444 in Switzerland, one great artist who lived in Geneva decided to paint a picture of Jesus walking on the water out to the disciples in the boat and people Peter getting out of the boat and walking to Jesus. The theme of biblical stories has always been one of the three major themes that great artists use. They use the stories of mythology, especially Roman and Greek mythology. They use contemporary slices of life, portraits uh, of people, um, uh, still lives, uh, uh, still still paintings of, of uh, bowls of fruit and flowers, or uh, they'll walk outside and put up an easel and, and paint an avenue of trees. But the Bible story is also a constant inspiration to people who, who paint. And throughout the years of painting, up till 1444, people always tried to paint the Bible stories in exactly the way that they thought the Bible characters would have appeared in the Bible, Bible uh, robes, the uh, costumes, and they tried to picture what, what the Holy Land would look like. But Conrad Witz in 1444 had a different idea. And when he finally unveiled this huge painting that's still in the Art Museum in Geneva, the people who were looking at the painting suddenly gasped because they recognized the place where they lived. Witz had done the painting not of Jesus on the Sea of Galilee, but Jesus walking out on Lake Geneva. And in the background were not the rolling hills in the background of the Sea of Galilee, but way in the back you could see the Alps. There's Mont Blanc. There to the left of the painting is the Salive, the mountain under which the Adventist school of Cologne still sits today. And the people recognized their lake, their mountains, and suddenly they looked at the Bible characters and they were dressed like the people in the middle of the 15th century in Geneva would have been dressed. Jesus has a long, flowing red robe. The disciples look like fishermen on the lake of Geneva in the middle of the 15th century. And Witz started in that year, that was the first time anybody painted a biblical story in contemporary settings and costumes. But from that point on, all great artists have followed that, that example. And from then on, the next few centuries were all about painting the bibl biblical characters and the biblical scenes in the time of the people that lived, who viewed the painting. And I believe it ought to be called the incarnation principle of art. And all the rest of the great artists do it until our day. In our day, the people that paint the biblical stories are again trying to put Jesus and the Bible characters back in their time. You seldom see a picture of Jesus, do you, in a suit or dressed like any of us or dressed here at camp? 
Uh, the Adventist painter Harry Anderson came close when he painted the picture of Jesus knocking at the United Nations building in New York. It's frequently on the cover of his Steps to Christ. At least we have a contemporary building in a, in a modern city, but Jesus still in his long white robes knocking at the United Nations building. The closest I remember seeing to it was a series of illustrations that Insight Magazine created to be shown to young people. Um, must have been in the uh, mid-80s when I was working at the Review and Herald. And were done by the artist Daryl Tank, and perhaps you remember them. They're, they're hanging in walls and churches in many places now. Jesus in one place is sitting in a, in a chair reading a newspaper. Have you seen the painting? And, and uh, the headlines in the front are on some of the terrible things that are happening in our worlds today. And there's a tear coming out of Jesus' eye as he's reading the newspaper. Another painting, Jesus is leaning out of a window in a house and he's watching two young boys paint the side of the house. They have overalls on and they're painting with big rollers and they're having a great time and there's as much paint on the boys as on the side of the house and Jesus is leaning out and he's watching and he's got a smile on his face laughing at what the boys are doing. And another painting, Jesus is holding a little puppy that apparently has been run over by a car on the highway and you can see the sadness in Jesus' face. The artist, Daryl Tank, took Jesus and tried to put him in contemporary situations. Interestingly enough, that series of artwork received more criticism from people who saw the artwork and then wrote to the Review and Herald than any other set of artwork ever published by the Review. And the theme of most of the criticism was, how dare you put Jesus in a contemporary situation? It seems to me the question is, how dare we not put Jesus in a contemporary situation? What, what do we believe? That Jesus quit walking among us years ago? The presence of, the, of Jesus through the Holy Spirit is walking on the campground today. How dare we not talk about Jesus' presence here among us? Well, the incarnation is an incredible principle of divine ministry. And by the way, it is a principle of our ministry as well. Effective ministry is always incarnational. It moves into the neighborhoods where we live. In your churches, every one of them, if we... If we moved in for a month or so and did a demographic study of just the members of your church, we would find out all the neighborhoods that are in your church. I'm a pastor at a, a large church in Southern California. We have 2,600 members in our church, and we have many communities in our membership. We have... Um, we have Caucasian communities and Hispanic communities and Indian communities and Thai communities and Filipino communities, all worshiping together in the same church. In my church, like in your church, we have communities of senior citizens. We have communities of children. We have communities of teens and young adults and older adults, all different communities with different needs. And if ministry to each of those communities is going to be effective, it must be incarnational. It must come through the, the community, the neighborhood that those people dwell in. It's no good in Southern California to talk about exactly the same issues that you people face in New Zealand. It would be no good in New Zealand to talk about the issues that they're facing in Holland when they're not the same issues that you face here. Each community, each neighborhood has its own issues and its own community flavor. And if our ministry is to be effective, it must be incarnational, just like Jesus' is to us. Well, you remember what happened as the people built the sanctuary and all the wonderful things took place there. There is the court where they built uh, the, the tabernacle in the middle, the, the curtain on the outside and between the curtain and the tabernacle, the court. And there was a place of sacrifice where sinners would come and present their offering, usually a lamb, for poor people, perhaps a dove or two. 
They would come sometimes with just a handful of grain, if that's all they could do, and they would offer their sacrifice. If it was a lamb, the priest would, would uh, help kill it at that point, take it over to the laver, and it would be washed, and then it would be offered on the altar burnt offering. And then you remember that the, uh, the entrance to the holy place was on just one side. The priests who were allowed to go into the holy place would go in, and on the right-hand side as they entered was the candlestick, constantly lit, always being, uh, always kept going. The fire was never let out. On the left-hand side, uh, I, on the right side was the table showbread, wasn't it, when they went in? The candlestick on the left. There toward the most holy place was the altar of incense. And then you remember that one time a year, the high priest would go into the most holy after taking the sins of everyone in the camp onto his heart and confessing them all before God. He would walk to the one side of the, of the curtain, move it aside, and you remember that the children of Israel, afraid that some sins would go in unconfessed, uh, wove little bells on the bottom of the high priest's garment so they could always hear him moving. And if he didn't move for many, many hours, they would think maybe something was happening. They would try to figure out how to get him out. We're told that the way that they figured out how to get him out of the most holy place was they tied a rope around one of his ankles. And if he ever died in front of the, uh, the uh, Ark of the Covenant and many hours would pass and he didn't come out, they'd pull on the, rug and, uh, on the rope and try to pull him out. You remember that the high priest would go in, he would back up to the curtain, he would pull it aside, he would back in to the, to the uh, most holy place, back in. Now he was in that place, the most holy place of all the places where Israel worshipped. He would begin to inch his way to the right until his foot came in contact with a pole. There were two long wooden poles overlaid with gold that were put through the rings on the bottom of the Ark of the Covenant. And they stuck this way out underneath the curtain into the holy place. And the high priest would move until he came in contact with that pole. And then he would lift his leg up and he would step over the pole. And now he was right in front of the Ark of the Covenant. And he would turn around and he would begin to communicate with God there. Uh, doesn't it make you wish you were a high priest? Just one day of the year you could meet face to face with God. And God communicated in a number of ways there. Well, you remember all of those articles of furniture, but you remember that they didn't always stay in that very place, but that from time to time the Israelites would get up in the morning and they would, the first thing that they would do would be to go to the to the center of the encampment. Now, sometimes we picture the sanctuary the tabernacle right in the middle and all of the tents crowded around, much like we are here. But the Bible tells us in Joshua that there was a large space, a thousand yards, sorry I can't translate that to meters, between the tabernacle and the first row of tents. So in the middle of the camp of Israel, there was this large hollow square, a thousand yards in diameter from the, from the edge of the square into where the tabernacle was, and another thousand yards out to the edge, in all directions a thousand yards. So people would come to the edge of the, of the great hollow square in the middle of the encampment, and they would look there to see if the tabernacle was still there. And if it was, then everything was fine. They would go back to their tents, and they would uh, go about their daily experience. But sometimes, frequently, they would come to the edge of the hollow square and they would look and they would notice that the priests were packing up the, this tabernacle and that the cloudy pillar that was right over the most holy place had gone up into the air and taken off. And whenever that happened, people would run back to their tents, pack their suitcases, pack their tents, and then they would begin to get in the order, and everybody in the camp would follow the cloudy pillar until the cloudy pillar stopped and they would make camp again. The priests who were distinguished to do this kind of thing would run into the most holy place. Now God's presence had risen 
and gone on. They would take down the, uh, the tent around it. They would pick up the Ar Ark of the Covenant by those four poles, put it on their shoulders, and they would begin to march. They were the first ones out of the camp. And they marched following the cloudy pillar. And they would go until the cloudy pillar stopped. And when the pillar stopped, the four priests that had the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders would march until they were directly underneath the cloudy pillar. They would go right underneath it. They would orient themselves north, south, east, and west. They would put the Ark of the Covenant down in the right position. And then the entire tabernacle was built up around it. And then the people would come and they would build their camp around that very thing. Um, just take a minute and, and look at uh, Numbers chapter 9. No, you know what? Let's look at the last, uh, the last chapter in Exodus where the same story is given in a little uh, less way. We won't take time to read Numbers 9 now. But you see in Exodus, it's uh, chapter 40, verse 36. And all the travels of the Israelites... Whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all the house of Israel during all their travels. It occurred to me studying for this morning that the only time that the children of Israel are called travelers instead of wanderers is when they're following the cloudy pillar. On their own, they're lost, and they don't seem to understand it, and they wander about in the wilderness. But when their eyes are fixed on the presence of God, and they're following the cloudy pillar, they're travelers, sojourners, pilgrims. Wanderers or pilgrims, wanderers or travelers. It's a good distinction, isn't it? At the center of the Israelite camp was the presence of God in the tabernacle. And it is exactly the same for you and me today. At the center of our existence is Jesus, our Savior. And everything in the tabernacle represents him and his ministry to us. The lamb that was sacrificed, remember John 1.29, says, Behold the Lamb of God. That's Jesus. The sacrifice itself, 1 John 4, verse 10. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. The sacrifice is Jesus. The laver, where the sacrifice is, is washed. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. When the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things that we had done, because of his mercy, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, who he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Lord. The washing represents the ministry of Jesus to us through the Holy Spirit. Inside the, the holy place is the bread of showbread. And John 6, 51 tells us that that's representing of Jesus as well. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. On the other side of the tabernacle, the light, John 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You know, when Solomon built the temple and the worship was going on, there was a great golden candlestick that was there inside the holy place of the temple as well. A copy of what was there in uh, in the uh, wilderness sanctuary. And we're told in the Mishnah, the Jewish commentary in the Talmud, that the wicks of the candlestick were made from the robes of the priest. When the priest's robes began to wear out and get frayed, they wouldn't just throw them away, but they would take the robes and they would tear them into strips and plate them together, and the wicks of the, of the candlestick in Solomon's temple were made from the robes of the priests. The robes of, uh, of the high priest are what we often talk about as Christ's righteousness. What a wonderful picture that is. The incense, Ephesians 5, 2, 
live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Even the curtain into which the high priest went to go into the most holy place. John 14, 6 says, I am the way and the truth and the life, Jesus says. No one comes to the Father except through me. Even the curtain represents Jesus. And the mercy seat is where Jesus is today ministering in our behalf. Hebrews 12, verses 2 and 3. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And the high priest, of course, is Jesus. Hebrews 3, verse 1. Fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess. At the center of our life, at the center of our worshiping, is Jesus, the Son of the living God. Everything we are, everything we want to be, every behavior we profess, every belief that we hold dear is centered in Jesus. And to the extent that we get away from that core of our behavior and our theology, to the extent we get away from the core, we are less Christian and less Seventh-day Adventist. As we find Jesus at the center of everything we do, we become what Seventh-day Adventist Christians are all about. Followers of the Lamb wherever he goes, instead of wanderers in a dry and empty, desolate wilderness. This morning, aren't you glad you are a follower of the Lamb and not just a wanderer? Let's pray. Father, it is good for us at this time in our daily activities to pause and to admit that without Jesus in our life, we're lost. We don't know where we're going. We have no way to get there. But we have awakened this morning and looked into the center of our existence and seen there Jesus, the Son of the living God, our Creator, our Sustainer, our Savior, our Master and Lord, our Brother. And we are confident walking through this day because we are following him wherever he leads us. We thank you for your continuing presence with us and for the joy that your presence gives us. In Jesus' name, amen.